Hello and welcome to another edition of To the Outdoors. You know, the northeastern United States and Canada are rich with a biodiversity of life. Some we see quite frequently, others we seldom or never see, but they all play a part in the web of life that the entire planet relies on. To begin with, let's take a look at some common and uncommon mammals that reside in western New York. Albinism and leucism are caused by a lack of melanin, which results in full or partial absence of color. Albino animals are extremely rare. Only one of every 10,000 mammals and one in 30,000 bird births produce an albino. Melanin is the pigment that causes the color of our hair, our skin, our eyes. So in animals, this can also result in, this also results in the colors of their feathers and scales and fur. Leucism, still rare but less so than albinism, has some noticeably different effects. So they do still have some pigmentation and this can result in a lot of those animals that appear just very faded in color, so they don't have that natural uh, darker coloration or they may even have splotches. Another way to tell the difference between the two is to look at the color of their eyes. You can have a leucistic animal that is completely white but has normal colored eyes. Um, when you have those red eyes, that is an indicator of an albino because the irises are actually clear so you can see the blood vessels in the eyes which gives the red eye appearance. In addition to physical issues such as poor eyesight and weaker feathers, these animals in the wild face other hurdles. Animals are a certain color for a reason, and predominantly that is going to be camouflage, whether it's for a prey animal that's using their camouflage to blend in and hide from predators, or a predator that's using its camouflage so that it can sneak up on its prey. And so there can be a disadvantage for these animals, um, but we do see these animals overcoming these disadvantages. White animals have been historically revered by many cultures. Native American people consider some to be sacred. Any animal that comes out white, especially with albino eyes and stuff like that, it's just because of the rarity, it's thought that there's something special about it. They're always being considered sacred. So if you happen to see a white animal in the wild, consider yourself fortunate. Because some of them are dealt with prophecies, then it's thought that, you know, their message is from the creator about. It's a unique opportunity to see something that you will probably not get to have another opportunity to see. Love them or hate them, squirrels are fascinating creatures. They can be a nuisance sometimes, especially if they get into your house or they raid your bird feeders, but they're also very important to the environment and a lot of fun to watch. New York State is home to five different species of squirrels. One of the most common is the red squirrel. Smaller than their cousins, the eastern gray, this diminutive squirrel comes with a spirited personality. They're red, they've got their fluffy tails, they're gorgeous uh, animals, they're fun to watch. Um, I love them the most because they're spunky and feisty, and so they're always real um, entertaining to watch. The reason for their aggressive behavior is because the reds are very territorial, and it's critical to their survival. The food that they're going to be collecting is coming from that area, so they need to protect it. And one way they've evolved and adapted is to be territorial, so they fight for their food a lot more aggressive than grays. All squirrels are important to the environment. The forest ecology depends on them. They do act as little tree planters when they forget where they cache pine nuts or seeds. They're going to uh, occasionally forget where they planted them or cache them and those seeds are going to grow into trees that will create the forest dynamics that we see around us. Western New York Raptor and Wildlife Care in Orchard Park recently took six baby squirrels into their care. Good Samaritan, Chanel, she uh, gave us a call and she was moving a camper or her RV and she noticed that something had fallen out from above the propane tank area and she looked and she was like, oh my goodness, that's a baby squirrel. And they did some digging, they looked underneath and sure enough there was a whole nest of six baby red squirrels and she found some help for them. These youngsters will be released next spring and will be there to remind us that even the smallest animals have an important role to play in the big picture that is our Mother Earth. Food webs and dynamics, how these organisms interact, they've evolved for millions of years, uh, these relationships, and they're all, they're all very important. We do need to protect them um, and make sure that we do care even about the smallest 
creatures. We do have to care about them. New York is home to two fox species, the red and the gray fox. The red fox is the most widely distributed carnivore in the world, and this species is found in every county in the state. Though historically feared and misunderstood, the fox is actually very intelligent and adaptable. Extremely smart and secretive and just fun to watch. Foxes have often been thought of as country animals, but that's not exactly accurate. They're also quite common in suburban areas. They're very adaptable to living around humans and the, the broken habitat that our housing developments have created. So you've got a housing development and then a small patch of woods, maybe a small little field, more houses, you know. So lately, it seems in the last 25 years or so, the foxes have started to come in closer to people to raise their young. <coughs> Many suburbanites are now learning to live with fox families on their property. Michelle Stelly and her husband Brian first saw a fox in their backyard in early spring. Her first reaction was to hope that they wouldn't make a den in her yard. But her attitude quickly changed when she found that the new family had taken up residence under their back deck. We actually did start seeing the babies coming out. So that was pretty cool. They were very little and brown, looked like little kittens. The new landlord took to the internet to learn the truth about her furry tenants and says it's important to pass this knowledge on to others. After I started posting pictures, friends, good intention, inboxing me saying, they're dangerous, you need to get rid of them, they're gonna, you know, this and that. And most people don't know and they aren't dangerous and you can live with them. Once the kits became more mobile, she even put up a sign to alert motorists driving through her busy neighborhood. For her, the experience was transformative, and though they've now departed, she would welcome them back next year. I would definitely encourage people to get informed, and if it, they do have a resident fox, uh, enjoy it, because it really is a nice, fun experience. Let the foxes stay, enjoy them, enjoy them. Coming up next, we'll show you an insect you usually hear but not see, and a hidden spring migration when To the Outdoors continues. Welcome back. You know, other life literally thrives beneath our very feet. It's an intricate, often unseen web that can be hiding in plain sight. Sometimes the smallest of habitats can support an abundance of thriving life. Vernal pools are a spring phenomenon essential to many species, including salamanders. The pools are brought to life each year by winter's thawing snow and spring's renewing rain. The definition of a vernal pool is, uh, you know, ephemeral um, water pool. The vernal pools, uh, many of them will dry up um, at the end of July or August. Before they disappear, the pools can be teeming with life. One of spring's most fascinating displays is the annual salamander breeding migration. They're um, under, under the ground surface during the winter months, uh, presumably below the frost line. And once uh, we lose this snow cover in the, our woodlands and we get a, um, our first um, spring rain or late winter rain, they emerge to start this migration. The amphibians then head to vernal pools to breed, which often can occur in only one night, after which the male salamanders return to their home territory. And then the females stay in the pond for one or two uh, more days and begin to lay the egg masses that will result in, um, you know, larval salamanders within a few weeks. Unfortunately, man-made barriers are often a fatal hindrance to the salamanders. We get a lot of uh, road mortality um, if the roads that they're crossing are heavily used. Which makes it all the more important to preserve secluded habitat. Alexander Preserve in the southern tier is where these salamanders were observed. 
It's a perfect environment, and it's one of many being protected by the Nature Sanctuary Society of Western New York. It's so easy to damage these habitats through purchase and protection. We're attempting to preserve, you know, what diversity we have and, uh, for future generations to enjoy. Cicadas may be the insect most evocative of summer. Their singing fills the dog days of the season, but they're usually heard and not seen. That's because most of their lives are spent underground, and depending on the species, that part of their life cycle can last anywhere from three to 17 years. They live entirely on tree sap. And tree sap, it's got nutrients in it, but they're very dilute. So it takes a long time of ingesting and filtering those nutrients out of the tree sap in order to make it to maturity. Once they do reach maturity, the nymphs crawl out of the ground and begin the next stage of their lives. They climb up a stem of, say, a tree or another kind of plant, and the back of their shell cracks open. And then the uh, kind of developing cicada inside the shell basically sheds its skin and leaves that behind. After a few hours of drying out, the insect is able to fly off and begin looking for a mate, and they don't have much time for that, as their lifespan above ground is only five or six weeks. That's when we hear their cacophonous song, and that's meant to attract a partner. The sound we hear, one of nature's loudest, is a function of a remarkable organ called a tympanum. It's sort of like, uh, say, if you have a bottle cap, uh, with the little dot in the top that comes up if the seal is broken, and they just flex it back and forth, making a click, and uh, click it back and forth really fast, and it makes that noise. The female then lays eggs in a tree, which hatch, and the nymphs drop onto the ground, burrowing down and beginning the cycle anew. There are more than 3,000 species of cicada worldwide. Here in western New York, we have a rare species specific to the Niagara Gorge, aptly known as the Niagara Cicada. When I first learned about it, I was told it was one of the rarest of its specific group, which are called the whip cicadas. Though we only experience them for a short while, that's plenty of time to appreciate this unique insect. They're just such a fascinating example of the way that evolution and different habitats have shaped the diversity of life on Earth. The order Lepidoptera includes all moths and butterflies. Together, they number over 180,000 different species, and it's thought that 160,000 of these are moths, with many yet to be described. In the U.S. alone, there are 11,000 moth species. Despite their numbers, moths remain less studied than butterflies. Is that difference because moths are nocturnal? Do you think that's why they're less studied than butterflies? That, that probably has a lot to do with it, but also, um a lot of moths tend to be smaller, more obscure. A lot of them are not very colorful, so they don't catch a lot of people's attention like the more colorful butterflies. The easiest way to tell the difference between butterflies and moths are the structure of their antennae. Butterflies have either hooked, knobbed, uh, or clubbed antennae. Moths have antennae that are either hair-like, without any swelling at the end, or without a hook, or they're comb-like. They have side branches like the teeth of a comb. Those moth antennae serve a very important function in their mating cycle, and they're amazingly sensitive. When searching for a mate, male moths are attracted to chemicals known as pheromones, which are released by the female moth. There was a researcher at the University of Illinois named Gilbert Waldbauer, and he and his students actually did a study where they tagged uh, male cecropias and release them at varying distances from caged virgin females and they attracted that caged virgin female attracted a male as far away as 11 miles. Moths also play a critical and underappreciated role in the environment. Like butterflies, they're pollinators and as they are mainly herbivores feeding on plants, they serve another important function for the planet. Well, they're important in recycling plant material. They, they in one step they take plant material and they transform it into um, creeping, crawling uh, insect biomass, which is then available in the food chain for higher level predators. And they're not without aesthetic appeal. Many moths, such as the underwing moths, are quite beautiful, and the giant silk moths are both large and spectacular, 
but have very short lives. They don't feed as adults. They don't even have functional mouth parts. So really their whole purpose as adults is mating and passing on their genes. So they're geared for mate finding and reproduction and that's it. Though we may not often see them, they are clearly an important part of our mother earth. Nocturnal creatures that help shed light on the beauty of nature. Every species comes with its own story. And sometimes there's common themes in those stories and sometimes they're pretty unique themes. So they're all, but they're all interesting. Coming up next, we'll take a road trip to the Southern Tier to release a rattlesnake, and then travel up north to Algonquin Park in Ontario to look at two of Canada's most iconic mammals. There are some animals we never get to see because they live in more remote habitats, say like Northern Ontario. Other animals, like the rattlesnake, we avoid instinctively because they're perceived as being dangerous. But the truth is, the rattlesnake is a reclusive animal and may be more than a little bit misunderstood. The timber rattlesnake once was fairly common in New York State, but now is on the threatened list, only found in the southern tier, the northernmost edge of its range in the United States. The species has long been seen as a threat, surrounded by myth and misinformation. Fortunately for both man and snake, research has shed much light on this misunderstood reptile. The New York DEC has been conducting studies since 2012. They've used surgically implanted transmitters to track the snakes. In total, I think we've transmitted 10 individuals over the past um, five, six years. Um, we've started to back off of that now that we've gotten this much information and trying to do more telemetry in areas that we haven't studied or haven't been studied in a long time. The study revealed some important information regarding population size in the area. Timber rattlers are a very secretive species and the transmitters allowed the team to track them to their dens or hibernacula. The snakes, which are normally on their own during warm months, gather together to hibernate in these underground homes during the cold months. Using that telemetry, the mark and recapture, we were able to kind of get um, an occupancy kind of an idea for these hibernaculas and then in 2015 we added the time-lapse trail camera photography study along with it and that allowed us to kind of get an abundance idea at these different hibernaculas. How many snakes do we actually have versus just the needle in the haystack snakes that we've been finding? The researchers located 10 dens within the area, yielding some interesting information. We were surprised to see that some dens were extremely healthy with, you know, 50 plus snakes and some of them had a measly eight, you know, and so it all kind of depended on which one it was and they were extremely variable. Because of their tendency to den together, it was easy in the past for people to wipe out whole populations quickly. Bounties were offered in the past to kill snakes and this was a main factor in the decline of their numbers in New York. People really didn't like snakes and then when you put a price tag on them, it's like a perfect little scenario um, for folks to go out and there's, there's people still around that remember going out um, as kids or, or with family members to these different areas. They know exactly where they were, you know, and they'd go out and, um, you know, dump gasoline down the hibernaculas or whatever they could do to get all these snakes out to collect those bounties. Now it's illegal in New York to kill timber rattlesnakes, and as we learn more, we understand their true nature. They're important for rodent control, which in turn helps control the spread of Lyme disease. Although they can do damage if provoked, they are actually quite docile and should be revered, not feared. Instead of seeing the negatives in some of these things, we need to kind of turn and see the positives and enjoy the fact that we still have this chance, that this habitat is still healthy enough to sustain the species, and um, we're lucky to have that. Our environment is fluid. Changes within the ecology happen frequently, but just because it's nature doesn't mean that all change is natural. Far too often, the catalyst for change is man. Ontario's Algonquin Provincial Park has seen some interesting and dramatic changes in its predator-prey dynamic over the last century, and it was the hand of man that brought it on. 
logging began the transformation. There was rather extensive logging and subsequently a lot of forest fires resulting from uh, the slash piles and careless fires and things like that. So this logging, cutting down all the trees uh, and these fires created a lot of new vegetation which was excellent feed for, for deer. At the same time, uh, wolves were being heavily persecuted in this area, not just by local people, but also by park rangers. The changes in habitat and the removal of wolves, an apex predator, allowed the deer population to explode and both wolves and moose diminished. That changed once again in the 90s when wolves began to make a comeback in the park. This area would have originally been uh, dominated by moose. Uh, as those early forests started to mature, and wolves uh, were no longer being killed, uh, the number of predators increased for the white-tailed deer, the habitat was becoming less good for them, and moose were actually able to rebound. And now uh, in Algonquin Park, we have over 2,600 moose. Deer sightings are now rare, while moose are seen quite frequently, and moose watchers are now common, especially in the fall. Though the secretive wolf is still tough to spot, just the chance to see one has been a tourism boon. The park offers unique wolf howl excursions during the summer that attract hundreds of hopeful wolf lovers. We've been doing uh, public wolf howls uh, since the 1960s and we've taken lots and lots and lots of people out to actually hear wild wolves after a park naturalist howls off into the distance. Hopefully wild wolves howl back and uh, people get to experience wolves that way. With more public education, the once rampant fear of these beautiful predators have gone the way of the deer. And though the Algonquin landscape will never again be as it was, mankind, in this instance, has made amends. If you're going to take something apart uh, with the intentions of putting it back together, the first, the first step is really to keep all the pieces, and uh, you don't want to lose any. You don't want any to you know, roll under a countertop or something like that. So um, yeah, by having all of your pieces together, you ensure that uh, your landscape more or less stays intact. Thanks again for joining us on To The Outdoors, and until the next time, always remember to respect and care for our Mother Earth. Taking you to the outdoors, I'm Terry Belke.